wonderful. Well, listen, welcome, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for making the time to come. Now, one of the things that, that I found as I've been working through this last eight months is that it's been a total and utter roller coaster. It's been a roller coaster of mindset, spirit, physically, definitely physically. I think I've probably lost 10 pounds and gained 10 pounds at least four times in the last eight months in terms of that, that change curve. And I can honestly, honestly say that one of the main things that's helped me through is being able to connect with my tribes, my communities, certainly outside of work, but absolutely in work, the various business communities. And one of our intentions as we've gone virtual with our network is to make sure that we carry on doing that. And that's one of the reasons why we're here today. So welcome and thank you so much for making time. It's just a couple of hours out of a really mad world. So thank you so much for coming. Listen, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome. Um, I can't see all of your all of your screens and all of your faces, but give us a wave if you if you're here. I'm really really delighted to welcome Marketing Derby. There are our connections and friends from Marketing Derby, from the Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce from the East Midlands Chamber of Commerce, from the Hounslow Chamber of Commerce, from Women in Wholesale, and from and on our clients and connections, old and new, and some of our, and, and many, many people who um, you know, we've met and some we haven't, so welcome to those we haven't yet met. Our purpose today is to give you an experience of what it's like to be on our network, and also to bring you some amazing value in terms of thinking about how you impact on screen on these tiny little screens that we've got to work with. Our network does three things. It does exactly what we're gonna to do today, brings you an award-winning world-class speaker so that you can experience the joy and energy of, um, of our speaker. And I'm not going to say any more, I'm gonna ask Colin, our chairman, to introduce David in a minute. Also peer-to-peer -peer problem solving. We are actually in a position where um, the use of virtual helps us to come together as a tribe and a community to help each other to solve problems. And our, we've got two things that we do in our network that help us with that. One is we run think tanks where we bring knowledge and share, in, share information and discuss, um, discuss problems that are happening for all of us right now. And then the other area is we run what we call a member needs you where we genuinely bring our own issues and our own business challenges to be helped by members. And the final thing that we do is one to one coaching and mentoring. And I'm really delighted to say that we are all organized to bring a complimentary leadership coaching session to each and every one of you. If that is something that you would find value in. I'll mention that again towards the end, and I know Joe is going to put some uh, some words in the chat that show you how you go about booking that after today. So listen, without further ado, I am going to introduce my colleague, hang on, go back a bit, there we are, uh, my colleague Colin, who is our chairman, to introduce David for us. Thank you, Amanda. These are sort of really crazy times and welcome everybody. Um, it's the first time on my Christmas list I've ever had a gazebo, an outdoor heater and a beer conditioning keg because uh, I'm finding bottled beer and tin beer pretty disappointing over this period of time. We've got a fascinating topic where it's all about actually how we create virtual engagement with everybody. And so many of us are working from home. Um, I think I saw figures where 60% of people are either working from their kitchen table, the coffee table, sitting on their bed, or sitting in their garden shed to try and actually continue to do business. I think less than 20% of people have had training on the technology, and less than 5% have actually had any training on how to turn up and make an impact. So I'm going to hand you over to David, who uh, is really going to give us some, some fabulous tuition in this area. And I'm sure we'll get some terrific tips. I've known David, I think I heard him in the first time about 20 years ago, actually, which says a lot about his age and mine. Um, but uh, if I had to pick some speakers, and I've listened to the likes of Tom Peters, I've listened to Stephen Covey, I've been live in audience with those people. But... Um, what would I say? What would I say about David? Well, if I had to hold a dinner party of my favourite five speakers, David will be amongst them. Why? 
because he's got a sparkling personality. He wears terrific shirts. He has a, he has a fabulous sense of humour. And in case you don't know what he's what he has done and and all the other skills that he's developed and how he's trained his mind, he's also got wonderful party tricks. So David, over to you. Really looking forward to an exciting session. Brilliant. Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to start off. Obviously, Colin mentioned my shirt. So what do you think of the shirt? <laughs> it's all right, isn't it? It's not bad. I like the shirt. I love the shirt. But I didn't always used to wear the shirt. And part of the reason was, was because of what's known as a chimp paradox. You may have read this book. It's been around a long time by a guy called Professor Steve Peters. And he came up with the concept, which is very, very simple. We have two brains, a logical brain and, and, and a chimp brain. The logical brain works on information, chimp brain works on emotion. And the chimp brain is seven times more powerful. So the chimp brain is the reason why we do the stuff that we do, that we know we shouldn't. Like overeat, drink too much and have affairs. <laughs> okay, maybe that's just me. And we don't do the stuff that we, that we know we should. Right? So the emotional brain is that thing where you have a hard day, you know, working away and you get a night and you think, I deserve the wine and the donuts, right? And, it, and it's, this is why we do the stuff that we, do, we know we shouldn't. But for me, the challenge is, is that over the years as a professional speaker, when I started out like nearly a quarter of a century ago speaking, I used to wear the, the commercial speaking uniform, which is a dark suit, white shirt and a nice colored tie to be flashed. And I wore that because I thought that's what I should wear. But it's not what I wanted to wear. I've worn shirts like this since I was a kid. Literally four years old. I posted on Facebook the other day. I'm wearing something that is even more outlandish than this. I'm four years old. And it's basically a blouse. My mother made it. And I, it's horrendous. But the shirt, the shirts have never changed. And so, but the thing is that my, my, my chimp brain would always come in and go, yeah, but people won't um, trust you. People won't think you're being serious if you wear a shirt like that. So I always wore the corporate speaking uniform. And about 10 years ago, I just decided, you know, bugger it, I'm going to wear the shirt. And guess what happened? Zero. I mean, I get the comments. Some people make comments and, you know, some people say nothing. A lot of people say nothing. But the difference that day is that I was wearing the shirt I wanted to wear. And that was not insignificant. Because instead of worrying about what other people think, I'm just cracking on and doing what I want to do. Now, don't get me wrong. If I wore shirts like this for work all the time, well, I do wear shirts like this all the time. But if, if we're wearing these shirts affected my ability to make money, I wouldn't wear the shirt. I might be daft, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> right? I'm not going to kill my business over wearing a shirt. But at the same time, you know, now I'm wearing the shirt I want. So... It's all happy days. But the problem is, is that is a massive challenge. We worry about what people think. And yet 99% of the people that we meet as we go through life, we will have, they will have zero impact on our life. 99%. And yet every time we meet people, what do we do? We talk about the weather and we talk about traffic. You know, I, I mean, I'm doing Zoom events. I've done no live events this year at all since... Sorry, this is live, face-to-face -face events since we went into lockdown the first time. But, you know, I turn up at an event and you go and have a chit-chat over coffee and they always go, oh, have you seen the weather? It's raining cats and dogs outside. I go, yeah, I've just come through it. What's your, what's your point, mate? <laughs> right. And they go, have you seen the traffic on the motorway? I go, yeah, I've just driven through it. What's your point? It's like, but people just, maybe it's social conditioning. But people are beige and vanilla, a bit boring when you meet them, just kind of letting themselves in gently. I don't do that. I'm straight in, I'm straight in for the jugular. Because life's too short, isn't it? If I've got five minutes with you, we're never going to speak again. I want to learn something interesting, something fun, something challenging, polarized. I want to know who you are. I don't want to know what you think about weather and traffic, but that's what we do. And so the question is why, you know, maybe it's our upbringing. Maybe it's the way that we are conditioned as we grow up. And, you know, 
I, you know, the one thing people always say to me, considering your childhood, you've done quite well. And I go, well, yeah, but how much of an effect does that really have? Because I'm not entirely sure. I'm not a psychologist. But as I was growing up, I had a very difficult childhood um, growing up um, you know, as a, as a kid here in Halifax. And that was part of the problem. I mean, having ginger hair and being from Halifax was not the greatest start in life. Um, I mean, and I'm not joking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, ginger hair gets you in a, in, a, in a state, you know, in a comprehensive, in a valley comprehensive up here, that gets you some stink. And Halifax, you know, it's not what you call a destination town, is it? Nobody said, you know what, kids, come on, pack your bags, we're off to Halifax for the weekend. Oh, no, really? It's not what you call a destination town. But the biggest challenge I had as I was growing up was that my mother was a lifelong alcoholic. That destroyed a marriage to my father, and she married a guy who was 65 years old when I was six. And he wanted the younger wife, he didn't want the two kids, and he, he beat me up every night. That was his idea of fun. So my mother used to get drunk and do things to me I can't share. And he used to beat me up every night. That, and that's basically my life as I was growing up from the age of four. The problem is, as we grow up, we tend to grow up through the prism of our parents, their attitudes, actions, and beliefs. Let me give you a quick, for instance, if you're a person of faith, you've probably got the same religion as your parents. Not always but most of the time, right? And for me, my prism was, that, was alcohol, violence, and abuse, and that's all I knew. So by the time I get to 16, it's really all going badly wrong. And it's just, it's just really, really challenging for me. And what I'm, it's, everything goes off the rails. So I start getting involved in crime. I start getting, uh, going out in the middle of the night, breaking into shops and businesses and stealing stuff. There was no peer group pressure. There was nobody else involved in this. It was just me. I went out and started getting, getting involved. And then I would start selling it down the town. So everybody started to get to know who I was. And then the police got involved. And it just all, it all, it all mounted. And within a three month period, I committed many burglaries for which I got caught for most of them. Al Capone, I was not. I attempted suicide twice. Couldn't make that work either. I got a police caution and then things escalated and escalated. And eventually they came to, it came to a point where one night I am talking, uh, I, I broke into a shop in Leeds at three o'clock in the morning and the police collared me coming out. They cornered me down a dead end alley and I came out fighting and I nearly killed a police officer that night with an iron bar. They put me on the floor and they kicked me unconscious, put me in hospital. And I go back to school, school knows what's going on, and they decide to expel me. And I'll never forget the letter that got sent home. It was, David is now a disturbing influence. He would be better off somewhere else. And that summer, I went to court, and I got a juvenile criminal conviction. But I can remember sitting there in front of the judge, and he turned around and he said something to me that was very poignant at the time. He turned around to me and he said, you know what, son, you need to start taking more responsibility. I'm like, yes, but. Because that's what happens, isn't it? What happens when, you, when people are successful? They always go, that was me. That was me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What happens when it hits the fan? They go, not my fault. I did my best. It's them over there. It's that. And all the finger pointing. It's amazing how quick we're trying to avoid responsibility. And I was exactly that. I meet a lot of yes, but people. When things are not going well, people go, yes, but. Yes, but, yes, but, yes, but. So for example, I'll, I'll give you a very quick, for instance, last night. So I, I'm a transformation coach amongst other things. So I'm helping this guy in Bolton lose some weight. So he's paying me, I'm coaching him one-to-one. -one. And I said to him last night, how's it going? And he came back and he went, well, not lost any weight. In fact, I'm, I'm struggling. And I went, why? And, he went, Where? and I said, well, what's the problem? You're at home. You can eat well. You can have food made for you. You know, what's the issue? And he went, yes, but I've got problems at work. And I'm like, well, I get that. But why is that? Not, that doesn't affect what you put in your mouth. And then we have an interesting, I'll just say it was an interesting and challenging conversation. Not challenging for me, challenging for him.
Because that's what happens when things hit the fan, when things get a bit difficult, we go off the rails, it, chimp brain comes in and it's all yes, but yes, but yes, but oh, well, yes, but that's the reason why. And it, for me now, as a 52 year old guy, and having been a speaker for a quarter of a century talking to half a million people, I do believe that that is one of the top three or four things that absolutely defines the difference between being average and good or good to great or great to amazing. It is responsibility. The more we look in the mirror and we go, what is happening here that is just down to me? What is it I can change in this circumstance that can help me move past this issue or be more successful or change my ways? And I get it, I do. But back at 16, hey, hey, no responsibility. It was all yes, but yes, but yes, but yes, but yes, but. And the judge said, fine, well, it's up to you, but you, you're going to get a criminal conviction. And now I'm fine. So I've got the criminal conviction. And then, then my life is in bits in my hand because all of a sudden now I've got no qualifications. I'm expelled from school and I've got a criminal conviction. So guess what? I can't get a job, right? Apart from working in a factory for a pound an hour, packing Christmas gifts into a box. So I'm packing Christmas gifts into a box. I didn't like it. Who would? And, you know, who would? Who would like it? Oh, by the way, just out of interest, if you've got any questions, stick them in the chat. They come up. There's a lot of noise. Morning or To be where you are now, David, after that background speaks volumes. Thank you very much. So if you've got something to comment to make as we're going to, please. Yeah, keep an answer any questions you like. So for me, back in the day, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a 16, 17 year old kid. I'm working in the factory and it's not going very far. And I didn't think that was ever going to be the end of my life. But, you know, at the end of the day, that's all I could do at that particular moment. And so it was it was an interesting time. And eventually I got out of the factory into an office that wasn't any better to quit an hour working on a VDU. Does anybody even remember what those are? visual display unit and it was just like it was like a computer but not really a computer and all i'm doing is punching in motor insurance details all day every day it was my numbing but i did it it's the only other job i could get and um, you know so i did that for a couple of years then at the age of 20 things changed because i managed to get in to the fire service become an operational firefighter and it was life-changing on every single level I am a working class guy from Halifax. That, you know, that's just my background. It's who I am. And being a firefighter in this town was top of the food chain. Right? Everybody loves a fireman. Everybody loves a firefighter. It was awesome. Plus, only two and a half percent of the people who apply to become a firefighter get in. Just one in 40. So all of a sudden, I'm kind of top of the pecking order. I'm getting the respect. But the most important thing is it gave me personal value because I, you know, one day I work in an office. Three months later, I'm in the back of a fire engine after I've been up at training center. And I was, yeah, I was out there saving lives and saving businesses and making a real difference in the world. And it just gave me some sense of purpose and it gave me, uh, it gave me some self-belief, gave me some value. My self-image changed from being a kid who was abused, you know, when he was younger through to just, you know, getting jobs, which I didn't think, um, you know, were, were very admirable. I have to say, I understand people do those jobs and that is fine for them. But for me, it did not make me feel great. It was not where I wanted to be, but I didn't see a path out of it. And the fire service gave me the path out. The challenge was, I wasn't very academic. So even though I'd not done very well at school, the um, that wasn't just down to the fact that I had problems at home. Part of it was I was just not very good at sitting exams. So I'd sat the fire service exams to get promoted a few times, kept failing them. And I'm sat there and I'm just, I'm, I, I was with an officer and I said, excuse me, sir, what am I going to do? <laughs> and he said, Dave, you're never going to pass. And I'm like, fine. Because he didn't say it with any malice. He'd seen hundreds of firefighters sit these exams and he looked at me and I did not come anywhere near passing. And he just, he made an assessment. He said, you're never going to pass. I said, fine, I'll give it up. Cause I didn't particularly want to get promoted. I wasn't that, I wasn't that ambitious and I didn't really want the responsibility. 
And, and so for me, being a firefighter was fine. It was a brilliant job. Loved just doing that. And, but I had no choice. There was no other option. So it was either be a firefighter or do something else or just, just stay at that particular level. But I wasn't unhappy. But you know how everybody has a nickname in the fire service, <laughs> right? Every firefighter gets a nickname. Well, because I couldn't pass the exams, my nickname was Thrombo, which was short for thrombosis, as in a slow-moving clot, which is one of those things that's hilarious. Still, it's about you. <laughs> you know, you sit there and you go, that's really funny. Is it about me? <sighs> right, right. Again, again, it's about Dave. But I was, I was in that place where I couldn't pass the exams. I didn't have to study. This is not complicated stuff. It's like, can you remember the 13 things on the fire extinguisher? Can you remember the six things you need to bear in mind when you go to a chemical incident, if you're in charge of the pump? And it's like, these are the things you need to remember. I couldn't do it, I couldn't memorize it. So I'm floating along, I'm a firefighter, everything's fine. I've come to understand that people only change when there's either massive pain or massive pleasure. People don't change for a bit of improvement or because of a bit of pain. It ends up being quite polarized. People only really change when things get really bad. And so for me, at that time, there was no pain. I, wasn't, I didn't care about money. I wasn't materialistic. I wasn't ambitious. I didn't want to be a leader. And I was doing a job I loved. And I thought that was it. 25 years old, 26 years old. I thought, this is it now. Retire when I'm 50, pick up my pension, off I go. And then one night I'm watching TV and something happened that was absolutely transformational. I was watching a guy memorize a pack of cards on TV. It was a terrible TV show. And it was, if you could, they were generating numbers. It was a live TV show. If you could generate numbers on this TV show, uh, they generated numbers on this TV show. And if those numbers appeared in your telephone number, you could win 20 grand. And I'm like, oh. I could do it with the 20 grand, right? But this is a terrible show. But this guy came on and memorized an entire pack of playing cards in three minutes. So he looked at each card once, put them all up, and then, then they would test him 10 times. Where's the jack of clubs? He goes, it's number 23. And I was like, oh. And it's like, what's, what's number two? And he go like, where's the four of clubs? And he go, what? How does he manage to do that? And it was just incredible. Anyway, I thought, you know what, it might be interesting. I might be able to use it for myself. I might be able to pass my fire service exam. So I went out, bought this guy's book, and I taught myself how to improve my memory. Eight months later, I went to the World Memory Championships in London. Only been to London once in my life with school when I was 11 to see Yul Brynner in The King and I. <laughs> right. And so I got to London. I'd never been, I ain't been since I was a kid with school. And I turned up at the World Memory Championships. What a set of geeks they were. <laughs> like proper, proper geeky, but buzz, buzzing head nerdy types. And I was like, and I was like, you lot are a set of geeks. And they went, yeah, you look like one of us, mate. And I was like, I think you'll find I'm a firefighter from Halifax. They went, no, son, you've got the buzzing head and everything. In you come. So I competed for two years in this competition and in the World Memory Championships. And I came fourth, two days competition. And my life changed in a weekend. On the Friday, I, it was just a hobby in my back bedroom. On the Monday, I'm getting read by a million people in the Times. It was incredible. And I go back to work, right, which was interesting. Because I go back to work and I go on TV. So the guys are all going, what's all this memory stuff? Well, you've been on TV and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, you know, I've just, I've just been doing this memory competition. Then the boss pulled me in. So this was like my boss's boss's boss. He was like three levels above me. I and mean, you know, in the fire service, you don't talk to officers. They're all idiots, right? I was a basic firefighter. We don't talk to officers. Anyway, he pulls me into his office and he goes, so Dave, what's all this memory shit then? And I was like, well, boss, I bought this book, went to London, came for happy days. And he said, can you teach me? I said, yes, I can. And I taught, and so I did, and I taught him how to use it to pass an exam. He said, do you want to teach it in the fire service? I said, no, I don't. No. He says, why not? And I says, because I don't want to stand up in front of people and teach. And he says, but you've got a gift. And I said, no, I just bought this book and then went to London and kind of competed and practiced a lot. He went, no, nah, it's got to be, it's definitely more than that. I went, no, no, it isn't. You just spend six quid on a book like I did. And he said, no, no, there's more to it. He says, but 
also, you've learned something, and do you, do you love doing it? And I go, yeah, yeah, and I've learned other stuff like speed reading and mind mapping and all of the stuff about the brain. He says, well, you should share it. And that's when I came to understand that what is really important in life is the legacy that you have, really. At the end of the day, when you look back, you want to look back on a body of work. And that body of work will be absolutely defined by the number of people you're in, you've impacted. It's not about money. It's not about... It's not about, you know, how big your house is and how many cars you've got. It's about impact and how many people you impact and how, how much you impact those individuals. And that's why I became a speaker. And that was all the way back in like the mid nineties. And so I became a speaker. I wasn't very good. You practice, you practice, and eventually I became a half decent speaker. And it was just, it was, it was a great time for me because I love sharing what I have. You know, what we have is not ours to keep us to ours to share. Right. And, and it just kind of all exploded from there. That was all the way back in 1996. 97, I went back to the World Championships, came third. 1998, I had a change of attitude. I was guaranteed to come second in the World Championships. But now I turned around and said, like, second place is first place loser. I was not going to win. I was not getting good enough quickly enough to beat the number one guy. So I just went, I'm not competing. And all my mates went, you're being an idiot, man. This, you know, this is second in the world. I was like, yeah, first place loser, isn't it? Because <laughs> I'm a bit of an idiot underneath. But what I did do in 98 was break a Guinness record for reciting pie. Now I'm kind of guessing you remember pie from school a little bit, right? Starts with a 3.14 and it goes on forever. Well, it's a Guinness record because there are no patterns and it's pretty much the most universal number in the world. Everybody learns it at school somewhere on the planet, right? And so I broke a Guinness record on the 1st of May, 1998, for reciting pi to 22 and a half thousand digits. <laughs> Which, it took me six hours a day for six months to learn this. Now, I, I did it as a part of a strategic plan. I knew it would be big. I mean, it's a Guinness record. The Guinness Book of Records, I think is, after the Bible, is the most, you know, best-sold book ever. It's been going for like since 1950s or whatever. And it's, you know, everybody knows where it is. I've spoken in 25 countries. Every time you stand up, do you know the Guinness Book of Records? Yeah, we do. And it was, it was incredible. It just, my, my world just blew up overnight. I did this thing. I did it in a hotel in Halifax. Only had a few people there. I didn't want any press. I wanted to be able to focus and concentrate. And, and I got the record. But the day after, it just went crazy. Because, you know, obviously I had the internet and email. And it just went nuts. And overnight, things changed. So within 18 months, I'd left the fire service. I became a full-time speaker. Now spoken to half a million people. It's been an amazing ride. Full-time speaker now for over 20 years. And managed to get book deals. <laughs> so I got a book, a, a book deal. The books that hold, sold 120,000 copies. Yeah, memory books that became a bestseller in its field. And then 13 years ago, I got a book deal to write, write my life story which is bonkers it's really surreal but i got in touch with the publisher and i've just said look you know i've, I've had an interesting life would you be, would you want <laughs> kind of interesting and you and it's just one of those things you can't even say it without laughing you know god i'm a very interesting person you can't say it without laughing can you anyway i said that i got in touch with this publisher and they went yeah we'll publish that when number one a million people have read the book worldwide they paid me over a hundred thousand quid in advance pat harper collins went number one in the sunday times and it, that's when it all started it just got a bit surreal everything's just i still sit there and i go who lives a life like that and i go i'm living a life like that and i go how the hell did this happen and i've done more tv i went i did start doing like stuff like gmtv and um, good morning and and this morning and um you know blue peter and then eventually, I just sat there one day, 2003, and I thought, you know what? I want to go on a really big TV show. And, and so I emailed the Oprah show straight off the website, the Oprah Winfrey show. This is a show that was going out to 120 countries, 50, 60 plus million people seeing every episode. And I just emailed the show off the website. I said, my name's Dave. I'm really good at memorizing cards and numbers, <laughs> right? Can I come on the show? And basically they went, yeah, okay. And I was like, oh. so off I went to Chicago. 
And, and, I, and I did some memory stuff and I met Oprah and went on the show and it, and it was just incredible. What is funny though about the Oprah show is that as a speaker, every speaker I meet says, oh, I would have loved to, it stopped now, but back in the day, people said, I'd love to go on the Oprah show. And I go, well, have you applied? And they go, no, no, no. And I go, why not? And then they come out with the worst words in the English language that should never be in a sentence. And they always go, well, if it's meant to be, nothing's meant to be, mate. Nothing. <laughs> and they go, trust me, how many people do you, do you think want to go on Oprah? Half the population. So why would they come and find you? You're nothing special. I'm nothing special. I'm a Guinness record breaker who, who has been in the World Memory Championships, who's had a best-selling book. I'm not the only memory Guinness record breaker who's had a best-selling book. And an international speaker who's been on Oprah. I'm not the only one. I'm not even unique. I'm not. Who is, right? And so, you know, people say, oh, no, well, if it's meant to be, it'll happen. I went, no, no, no. The only thing it's meant to be, mate, is you're an idiot. You've got to kick down doors. If you want it, you go out and get it. And the great news now is there's no barriers to entry. You can find anything you want. You can find anybody on the internet. You can start businesses for free. There's the barriers to entry. I mean, who would want to go back 20 years, let alone 120, try and run a business and set things up and get yourself in, in, the, in the media spotlight and get some publicity? Crazy. And But, you know, that's, that's what people are like. So Colin said, you can never have an impact on society only you have, until you've changed yourself. This is interesting. Because I did, um, I did, a, I did a newsletter, I did a newsletter, and I did it last night. And I said, the, and one thing that, one th I'm listening to an audio book, which is by... And what Phil Knight decided back in 1962 when he started selling Japanese shoes out of the back of his van, back of his car at track meets, what he decided to do was he decided on who he wanted to become, what he wanted to become known for. And I thought that was really powerful. And, and I read that and I finished it yesterday. And that was right, and it, it was, the book on the covers from 1962 to 1980, but the last 15 minutes out of what is a 12 hour audio book, last 15 minutes comes up present day. And he talks about the fact that it's about who he wanted to become and what he wanted to be known for and, that he, and how he created the change in himself. And I think that is really interesting. I, I hear too many people go, well, just take me as I am, whether you like it or not, disappear. And I'm not saying you should be artificial, and I'm not saying, but but we all have to evolve. I'm 52, I'm halfway through my life. My, my grandma was 100 when she died. I'm gonna to live to be 100. So I'm only halfway through my life. At 24 years into my speaking career, I'm only halfway through my speaking career. So I've got all this incredible opportunity to evolve and as I go, as I go forward. But I understand now that I kind of have to start with the end in mind, work my way back, decide what I need to do to evolve, to change and morph a little bit whilst retaining my core character and values and principles. But I think you have to change. If you don't, I think you'll just, well, you just go backwards, won't you? I mean, it's, I don't know. You just get left behind. But that's, that's one of the things that I, you know, that I've learned as I've gone along is, you know, go to the next level, morph into it, you know, take the challenge, feel a bit uncomfortable, don't do anything ridiculous, but push myself into an uncomfortable environment. Going on TV was uncomfortable back in the day, but then I got used to it. And then I decided to go on a higher level of TV show, which is Oprah. Writing books never came naturally. Being a speaker never came naturally. And eventually it's kind of evolved and gone through there. Andrew said, if you want it, if you want it, go out and get it. it. Can work against you as a wayward youth, but a powerful mantra in a career personal development context. <laughs> if you want it, go out and get it. Yeah, well, I decided I wanted expensive clothes, so I just went out and stole them. That's not a strategy for success. That is def that's definitely not. And, you know, that, I mean, I, when I go into schools a great deal. I've spoken to hundreds of thousands of kids now around the world, and I, and I tell them, you've got to go out and get it. But the great news is there's no barrier to entry. In fact, I tell you, this is quite fun. This is an interesting exercise. I stand in, I stand in front of kids 
And I go, who wants to pass their exams and really do well? Nobody puts their hands up, maybe a few kids. I said, but who would like to be a billionaire, right? Kids just think about money. And they all go, yeah, I would, sir. And I go, awesome. Do you want to know how to be a billionaire? They go, yeah. And I went, right, go home tonight and watch like 200 videos on YouTube about that, how to code. Learn how to code really, really well. Then take something that's on the internet and make it better. Or take something that's not on the internet, put it on the internet. And they go, is that it? And I go, yeah. Uber, no tax. They, they don't own any taxes, probably. I mean, they might own a few, but essentially they don't. Airbnb, difficult model at the moment, I guess, but essentially don't own hotels. It's just coding, just algorithms. And I know there's more to it than that, but essentially the barriers to entry now have just dropped. I mean, you know, what would you do to start? How would you start a hotel chain in 1900? Holy cow, right? And I say, go out and get it. Just go out and get it. Find for it. Find the people who've got what you want or find the people who are where you want to be and ask them how they got there. And that's always been a mantra for success for me. When I got involved in memory, I saw the guy on TV and he was amazing. His was the book I bought. He's been eight times world memory champion. The next nearest guy is three. And trust me, I'm zero. So I'm going to the guy who's the best memorizer ever. And I learned from him. When I became a speaker, I went down to a speaker meeting. I found the guys in the room who were earning 200 plus grand a year. How are you doing it? How are you making the money? When it came to writing books, I went and found a guy in Leeds who had had a best-selling book, number one best-selling book in my genre. He introduced me to his agent. I went to chat to the agent. I learned from her. She was getting books out there. She actually said my book would never get published and passed on it. So I went to the publisher direct, kept all the agent's money. Happy days. So that's the other thing. Don't always believe what people say. That's only their perspective. No matter how well-versed they are, how well-educated or experienced, don't always just take it as the gospel truth. That's their version of the truth. That's their version of their experience. So Mark said, how do you eradicate self-limiting beliefs? For me, it's about process. So what I do is, Whenever, if I'm sat there going, I can't do this, what I do is I go and find somebody else who's done it before and just literally, like I've just said, and find out. So at the moment, for example, we are setting up an entire second business on transformation. It's middle-aged guys, essentially guys who are 40 and older, who are fat. Because 10 years ago, I was 20 stone. And I lost, um, you know, I lost five stone in five months. I put some back on, put 60% back on. And then I went out and I lost it again. And now I've kept it off and got myself in great shape. A year ago, I ended up on a bodybuilding stage wearing nothing but the teeniest, tiniest pair of budgie smugglers and covered in about 14 gallons of fake tan. And in bodybuilding stage, right? Masters bodybuilding, I looked like nothing on earth. I look great. And so what we're doing is I see there's a massive interest in this. And I know a lot of people. And so we're running events and we're going to be running. A sec so we're setting up a second business, but it's got to be online. It's got to be an online community based. Guys want to come together, share their experience, learn from each other, have accountability. So we are following people who are online now. I'm not looking for speakers who are going out and talking about this. I'm now insert myself into the online community. And what I'm doing is finding people around there making a million, 10 or even $100 million a year online. How do they do it? particularly those that bootstrapped it and start from zero, have no investors because that's not what I'm interested in. So find specifically people who still own 100% of the business and are making 10 million plus. And what I do is I just find, and that overcomes my self-limited beliefs because I think success is process, 100%. Find some deal who's already done it, take that, play it, have a go, adopt and adapt a little bit for your own circumstances and you'll be fine. I believe preparation is key. What preparation techniques do you employ to help you deal with those uncomfortable and challenging moments? Um, what preparation techniques do you employ? For, for me, I practice like crazy. So when I first became a speaker and I did 14 sessions in two days, I practiced for weeks. I mean, just hours and hours and hours a day. I just don't think you can practice too much. You never become robotic. So for me as a speaker, that's what I do. 
always practice like crazy. I'm doing a two day summit in January, a weekend summit. I'm practicing now, crazy, crazy practice. Im immerse myself, make sure that my research is done, make sure everything's backed up with evidence. There's no bro science or stuff I've learned off a of Twitter feed. Um, yeah. How do you deal with those uncomfortable challenging moments? Maybe I'm looking at the, maybe that question is when, when a challenging moment comes along. I, I just, I think I'm at an age now, I'll be honest, Melanie, I'm at an age now at 52 where I just know there's going to be speed bumps. And so I just go, well, this is part of this. This is part of the process. I expect there to be 10 speed bumps in getting the new business up and running. So when one comes along, I go, well, that's one of the list. I just wait for them to come. I want saw a sales guy turn around and say, that he understood that for every 10 calls, he'd get, a, he'd get a, a meeting. And he said, so all he needed to do was go through the other nine calls. And I just thought that was great because people go, well, how do you deal with the nine calls? I go, well, each one just gets me closer to the one that's where somebody says, yeah, come and see me. So I thought that was quite interesting, an interesting approach. Who did you lose your weight with? And why did you choose them? I did it on my own. I just did it on my own. So what I did was I just literally, I did it on a calorie deficit basis, fairly straightforward. I I knew that 3,500 calories is a pound of fat. So if I wanted to lose half a pound a day, which I needed to, to maintain my motivation, no one pound a week, no, no, no. I wanted three and a half pounds a week, which is a bad idea, terrible idea, but I didn't know any better. So I just, you know, I was so fat. I just think I've got to get short. I've got to get, my waist was up like 50 inches, you know, squeezing myself into 46 inch trousers with a massive belly over the top. I just needed to get short. So I needed quick wins. And I mean, I did, I did half a pound a day for five months, but it was just simple maths. So if I, if I, I burn, I got, I got to the stage where I was burning 3,500 calories a day through my basic metabolic rate and my exercise. And so I knew that if I ate 1,750 calories a day, I would lose half a pound a day. And I did, and that was it. But it was a bad strategy because it was just, it was head down, backside up and go for it like crazy. And that was not a good strategy. Terrible, terrible strategy. That's why I put 60% back on. So three years ago, in September 2017, I'm sat there, I'm, I'm carried on exercising, I'm fit and I'm strong, but I put three of the five stone back on. So I, saw, I thought, now I need a coach. So I got myself a bodybuilding coach. I got myself a Mr. World, former Mr. World from down in Dewsbury. And I got in touch and I said, look, you know, you've been recommended by somebody. Uh, you've trained other guys to compete in bodybuilding competitions. So I'd like to come down and see you. So I went down and saw him and he, and he last three years, utterly transformed my life. Educated me on, on nutrition, how to train, how to avoid injuries, how to phase my training, all that stuff that I never really did before. I just went, to, went for it like a bullet again. And some, sometimes that gets you started, but it doesn't get you into any things. Yeah, coach. And uh, yeah. Co coaching coaching was good i mean i'm not i'm not big on accountability stuff i see that most people need it but i didn't i just needed a coach i needed someone to educate me and i turned up and, and he told me what to do and then when we got near the competition i said look i'm interested in entering a bodybuilding competition i don't think i've got even remotely close to the de discipline required i know what it takes i don't think i'm going to get there and he said well let's just start so as we got closer you just keep that was a self-limiting belief but you break it down bit by bit. We lose a bit of weight and get myself into a stage where I'm eating more food and losing more weight. Crazy times, right? Those are crazy things so that you don't understand until you do it properly. And then at the end of it all, yeah, he said, right, well, you know, you can think about competing now. So we sat there and put a plan in place to do that. I had to learn all the stuff about posing, which was incredibly hard. You know, it's like, you, you know, tense your muscles for, for like five seconds and it hurts, right? Imagine doing that like a hundred times when you're, when you're under calorie and it, it's, it's brutal. <laughs> but it's why I like it. I love bodybuilding because it's the most brutal thing in the world. Head down, backside up. When is it a good strategy to just go for it? Well, I'd, I'd, uh, when is it a good strategy to just go for it? I, I don't know. I think in the beginning, you've just got a massive action. I'm a, I'm, a mass, I'm a fan of just massive action in the beginning. Just drive it forward really fast and hard to get it out of the gate. You know, it's a getting a plane off the ground, you know, just full power 
And yeah, you're going to wobble a bit. You might go off the runway. You might end up in the bushes or whatever. But massive action allows you to learn fast, fail fast, and move on. This thing about, oh, well, it needs to be perfect. And I'll just make, because perfection is just the killer. So people sit there and they're going, I'm going to get my product ready. It's going to be perfect. They get it ready. It takes them months and months and months and months. And then you sit there and you find out, actually, that's not what the market needs. And then you have to change it. Right. Well, it's, it's 20 past. We're supposed to be having a break at quarter past. Thanks for the questions. When you come back, what I'm going to be doing is sharing. The idea with that is just to kind of share a bit of background about me, some of the lessons I have learned. Hopefully you can apply. But when you come back, we're going to be talking about impact in a virtual environment, which is this. So I'm going to give you a shed load of tips and strategies and ideas on how to really maximize your impact. Pippa's put a question in there. Yes. Revenue fatigue and lack of motivation and confidence. What the theory? You don't appear to have had much of this. How do you manage and overcome these feelings and energies? And, uh, well, for, for me, there's two, two, two main things. First of all, I've learned to really manage very, very well the things I can manage. I, I you know, for, for example, the moment a new lockdown was coming, I went out and got some exercise stuff, stuck it in the barn. So I'm not going to go, yes, but I can't get to a gym. That's why I put a lot of weight on. <clears throat> I can control what I eat and so on. So managing the things I can manage is important. And you know what? The longer this has gone on, and I know this is going to sound brutal, the more I've come to understand how amazingly privileged I am to be able to work from home, to still be able to run my business. There's a lot of people out there are suffering on an unbelievable level. And I'm, and I am on some level. I'm not getting to see my grandkids the same. I'm not getting to see my kids the same. I, I can't do my job as well. My income has dropped when I went into lockdown. My, my income just disappeared for a year. Uh, it's well forever, really, you know, until, until we're going to go face to face again. But you adopt and adapt. I'm, a, I'm afraid to say it's kind of, sh it's, it's kind of shown how, in, I know this is rather a negative way of looking at it, really, but, you know, it's, it's shown me how, how fortunate I am. I've known bad times and this is not a bad time in my life because, you know, I'm in a great relationship. I have a good relationship with my kids and, and those things, you know, it's, it's when, a, you know, like the old phrase, it's, you know, you only find out how strong a tea bag is when it's, you know, put in hot water and, <clears throat> and uh, yeah. So, you know, we're in this for things like sleep. I sleep better. You know, I, I manage, you know, I get myself a timetable. I get up at the same time every morning. We get up at five o'clock and we go and exercise. We've got to bed at nine o'clock. And, you know, we just get a good routine. Routine, I think, helps. And you can do that more. So for me, it's, it's less about what the damage COVID has done or coronavirus. It's more about, you know, what, 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 how it's helped. Because for me, my life was, I was just here, there and everywhere all the time, a lot of travel. Last year I did, I think four countries, five countries. I was 100,000 miles in a plane, 35,000 in a car. It was tricky to manage my way, you know, to my food and my exercise, booking hotels up and down here, there and everywhere. So therefore, it's, you know, what are the benefits of, of doing this? But, you know, there, there are some things I found difficult. Uh, you know, the, I've been bored. Boredom is not good for me. I've been sick of being in the house because I stick to the rules and um, I just stick to the rules because, you know, we're in a massive hotspot here. <clears throat> so I'm just not going anywhere. I'm staying here. If I don't need to go out, I don't. There's no point two of us going to the supermarket. Karen likes to do it, so she does it. But yeah, so even though I live in a very, I live in a very nice house, you know, you can see the panelled walls <laughs> behind me. That's not green screen, that's my house. But at the same time, it's, it's what it is. But you know, you know, I get up and I'm grateful for small mercies and we, you know, I don't really do that kind of stuff normally, but you know, COVID has given me the chance. It's given me the, given me the time to sit and think about it. And aside from that, I look to, you know, I've got audio books and I've got books and I'm just doing a lot of reading. I've set up a second business with the transformation stuff. Couldn't have done that otherwise. Not really being a speaker as busy as I am. And therefore I'm, I'm, I'm looking for the positives and what can I use the time for and, and how can I manage my life better to make, sh make sure it works? There are, there are difficult things. My dad lives in America. He's housebound. He's 80, 81. So there's, there's some issues. 
Karen's dad's in a wheelchair, he's down in Oxford, and we're not getting to see, we haven't seen him all year. So there are challenges, but you just got to try and focus on the positive, haven't you? And I know it's cliched stuff, but what else, what else can you do? Really? Right, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share with you some strategies on how to present remotely because it's just a massive thing now, isn't it? We've all become hardwired to this, receiving as well as delivering. And, and I think it's really important. So what I'm going to do is just share with you a bunch of tips and strategies about how you can make sure you have the best impact you can possibly achieve doing it this way. So when it comes to presenting remotely, there are four different things to consider. There's preparation, this setup, and delivery, and this technology. So when it comes to the preparation, that's the kind of the backdrop to all of this. The first thing is you've got to practice. It surprises me how many people don't really practice doing it. And I've already mentioned earlier, what is one, things, one of the things that I do all the time to overcome self-limiting beliefs and make sure I'm as successful as I can? is a practice because I don't think you can over practice doing almost anything. And so for me, when I first started doing this, what I did was I filmed myself. So I'd get me, I'd get me my phone and I stick it upon the mantelpiece at eye level and I'd just talk to it and then I'd watch the video. And so getting, you know, getting some feedback off other people, practicing, it amazes me how many people are still presenting astonishingly badly and they must just never see themselves they must just never have got there and, and taken a, a zoom recording and looked at it and seen some of the very simple basic things they're doing i mean and, and i'm going to go through them now but the first thing straight out of the box in preparing yourself to do it really really well learn you know get some feedback film yourself sit there look at it work out what is it you know you're doing wrong and stop doing it. Next thing is, should you stand or sit? I think it's, it's been a big kind of chatting, it's been a, a big talking point in this speaking fraternity. I'm a bit mixed on it really, to be honest. I think I'm doing a, I'm doing a, a keynote speech next week. So, and it's a national, the national sales conference. There's me, there's Midge Ewer, <laughs> there's some big speakers on there. And I'm one of the speakers in the afternoon. I'm going to stand up because I think it gives it a greater sense of occasion. If you're doing something like this, where it's a nice chit chat and you know we're kind of talking and it's more training environment and it's a bit more, maybe more homely, a bit more cozy, sitting down is not so bad. The, the, the advantage of standing up is you're able to use the space better. So you can walk from side to side a little bit, walk in a little bit, you can still use the canvas that you've got. When you're sitting down, it's more static. And the other thing is as well, is that people will sit there and kind of sit there and talk to you like this, or they'll, they'll kind of, you know, they'll like this or slump forward. Things that you wouldn't necessarily do if you were face to face. If you sat there with somebody, you'd probably sit fairly upright, present straight to camera. Whereas online, it seems to be, you know, people find it a bit more difficult. But what I always say as well is practice, try both. Don't get caught out by only doing one instead of the other because you know sometimes you may wish to you may wish to change. The the other thing when it comes to preparation is learn to talk as if it's just one person. So I'm talking to you. We've got 62 people on here. I'm one of them. So there's 61 of you that are watching me. But the fact is, you're all in separate rooms. So it's not the same as having 61 people in front of me and you all together as a group. Because when you get together, there's, a, there's kind of a, a group thing. There's a, there's a group energy. But there isn't when you're speaking to one person. So when I'm talking to you, I say I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to you all. If I was to say thank you for coming today, I would say thank you for coming, not thank you all for coming. But what happens is, the, as a presenter, you look down and you go, oh, I've got this gallery, it's all these people. Yeah, you're, you feel like you're presenting to a lot of people. But in reality, what it is, this is effectively a one-to-one, -one, but with 61 people. It's not one to 61. That is a fundamental difference. Make sure, that you, make sure that you understand that when you speak to the camera, there's only one person looking back. So remember, try and make it particular. And if you do just some of those preparation things and just have a little go with those, it will make a difference. The second one is, Standing up is a totally different energy. Invest in a whiteboard or a flip chart. 
great idea. This is brilliant. And in fact, it's something that I'm talking about all the time. And because I'm getting involved in webinars. <clears throat> oh, English government PowerPoint. Yeah, that was terrible. That was terrible. Yeah, that, that was poor. Um, yeah, one thing that we're looking at now, I'm looking at webinars because webinars sell. They just do. They are brilliant, especially if you can deliver really well. The challenge with webinars is most webinars are you in a little box up here and a, and a, and a slide. And the thing is that, who you know, we're buying from people, right? Great thing that's just coming through on the online marketing guys, whiteboard webinars, simple as you like. It's got one outside. That's all it is, it's just a whiteboard. You sit there, wipe it off, do say something else, wipe it off. So you're full screen, but you're also giving information as well. Great idea. Good tip, yeah, presented to one person. Set up. Some people are not gonna like what I'm gonna say. <laughs> Because right, I always say the same thing. Just think, look, this, this is perfection. <laughs> right. I, don't, I can't even say it without laughing. I don't mean me. I just mean this is a perfect setup, right? And I'll, and I'll go through it. First of all, lighting. So I've got a window here with light coming through and I've got a wall over here. But I've got a ring light over there that cost me 70 quid. We're not talking investment on a high level. So we've got perfect lighting on both sides of my face. The number of times I've seen people, massive light here, and you can't see the face because of too much light, and dark over here. When you're presenting, all they've got is your fizzog. They've only got your ugly mug. That's it. If, if you're going to reduce your ability to have an impact on an audience, uh, to the people who are listening, because you're, you're not properly lit, that is a killer. I mean, you wouldn't do that you know, if you were face to face, you wouldn't sit there with half your face in darkness and half, half of, you know, so that people can read your face. This is important. What you've got to remember is that this is highly reductive. When you're speaking face to face, it's all of the kind of things that you can share. Your personality comes through a little bit differently, your body language, how you treat other people. If you're, if you're having a, a meeting and somebody comes up and asks you if you want to, you know, do you want some coffee, how you talk to them, all that kind of, but this, it's just this, this little canvas. Make sure you're well lit. Very, very important. How do you manage when you don't get to see people's reactions? Uh, you carry on anyway. Just carry on trucking. Do not look at people's reactions online as anything like a true statement of what they're feeling. This is important. <clears throat> really important. Because people have got zombie zoom face. When you're talking to people, this is why it's different when it's face to face. Face to face, you're talking to a group of people. One person will laugh, <laughs> and then it'll start a ripple. Or somebody will clap, and then everybody else goes, oh, I think, I think we're clapping. So it becomes a group exercise. Not when it's one to one, 61 times. So what you must do is not look at their face as, as any kind of understanding or reflection of what they think. Because they sit there, and it's just like, honestly, they look like they've had a stroke. I'll just look at you like that for an hour. And at the end of it, you go, is that all right? They go, that was brilliant. And you're sat there thinking, why didn't you tell your face then? But that is what is happening. Metaphorically, as well as physically, there's just a gap that isn't there face to face. That's why I'm talking to camera now. You're all here. I'm not looking at any of you because I have zero interest in your response. Because otherwise, all I'm going to be doing then is just going, oh, well, so-and-so's laughing. That must be funny. But they're not laughing. What are they thinking? You're going to kill yourself if you try and gauge people's responses. You're better off gauging nobody's response. Pick your spot on the camera, talk to the camera, and just go for it. Go for what you say, what you want to say, in the way that you want to say it. Otherwise, you'll just end up flip-flopping. You, you, you'll just you start panicking. Don't do it. Silence is often a killer. Great question, Anna. Silence is often a killer. Maybe, maybe not for a speaker. Maybe for a speaker. What do you recommend for those in very small flats in terms of good lighting and background setup? Then you get a light. Honestly, I've done Zooms where I pull the curtains on so there's no outside interference from light because it's just going, because it's going to be a long time. And you just get a ring light. <clears throat> You get ring light, my ring light is behind the cam cord, uh, behind the webcam. That's and that's what you do. So I've got little, I've got the house lights on as well, but it doesn't really matter. Just make sure your face is well lit. 
If the background isn't lit, well, it doesn't matter. Just make sure your face is well lit. Don't have the ring light three feet away from your face. It'll be like, <laughs> right? The light is sat next to the sun. But, uh, you know, mine is like, whatever, 10 feet away over there. So I had Karen wandering around making sure that the lighting was good. But you've got to be well lit. You've got to be. And, and if you've got lack of feedback from the online, and this can be difficult to take on board, and you have to accept this is what it's like now. Have I lost my audience? No, it's just what it is. You've just got to keep on going. Because sometimes if you keep going, is this working? Just put something, yeah, is everybody fine? Yeah, you know, I tell you what, we'll just unmute, just tell me what you think, 61 people. I'm not going to do that. Because all it's going to do is be a lot of chat. Are you going to be talking over each other? No. If you've got something to say, if you're doing a presentation, you get it, you deliver it. And this is the best way to do it, generally speaking. Let people put it, let, let people put stuff in a chat box. You flick over and, you know, once you get good enough at it, you stop speaking, you look at it, and then you come back. When we run virtual sessions, one-to-one -one impact coaching, able to practice how to do it well. Yeah, it's, it is about body language as well. There's a lot of body language you can use, like using your hands like this, and yet people sit there and go, oh, because oh, oh. the problem is all this, they think that nobody's, because they don't see people, then, it, you know, the body language becomes more reductive as well. But it's still got to be as energized. It's still got to be as passionate. You've got to talk as if you're talking to face to face, even though it's just a camera. It takes practice, a lot of practice, but the more you do it, the better you get. And green screen. I know some of you have got green screen. I don't like it personally. I've never seen it used well. I think that people practice green screen stuff like this, and then all of a sudden they move and half the face disappears. I think it's just so artificial that it's not a true representation of you anyway. That's my, that's my belief. I know people will disagree, but I don't like it. I think the best environment, the best background you can get is a plain one. Now, obviously I've got a paneled wall here, but it's nothing to distract you. You don't want distractions. Don't put books behind. Don't put books behind because people start going, oh, I wonder what they're reading. Oh, I've read that. Anything that's a distraction is a problem. They will sit and read it. This has been shown when you do face to face. If you have something on the screen, so a lot of time when people put bullet points up on the screen when doing face to face presentations, they might have six bullet points. They put them all up and they start talking about the first one. What do you do? You read the other five. Neurologically, it's been proven, and this is important, very important. Neurologically, it's been proven that if you are talking and there's something on the screen to read, they will read what's on the screen and not listen to you. They will not and cannot do both. It's exactly the same online. If you have stuff in the background that they can sit and read and think about while you're talking, they will sit and read it and not listen to you. Make sure it's a plain background. <clears throat> so, someone, so someone said, I quite like mine. I presume, do, do you mean you, you quite like your your green screen, I presume. I don't, I don't care what you like. I have zero interest in what you like. I'm telling you what is best practice. I don't care what you like. I don't care what anybody likes. Likes, likes and feelings are not facts. Thoughts, I don't care what you think. It's amazing how many people go, oh, well, I like it. And I go, well, but do, is that best practice? No, but I like it. And that, that is a great example of chimp. Chimp overtakes logic. So if a logically somebody goes, well, that's not best practice. Chimp goes, oh, wow, but I like it. And, and I think this, and I think that, and I go, I don't care what your thoughts are. Thoughts are not facts. Go with the science, go with the evidence. You know, in life, if you go with evidence-based research, you'll never go far wrong. Just a thought. <clears throat> right, delivery. Getting people's attention online is always going to be an issue. Why? Because they've got stuff. Right, they've got stuff. I mean, many of you will have come in here thinking, you know what, I'll listen to this guy, but I'll just do a few emails like this. Because you're sat looking at the screen. And actually, you know, because you're looking at me, you're looking at the screen like this. Well, you could be doing anything. You could be doing anything and everything. You've muted yourself, I can't hear you. And you sit there and you just kind of tip tap away while you're watching. So you're listening and doing that at the same time. That's what people do when you, when you present. That's what it is. I'm going to hold back for a minute there. But that's what people do, isn't it? They get, get, they're getting stuff, they get, getting other stuff done. And I don't care, really. I mean, I, 
you know, a long time ago, I got, got used to the fact that I'm responsible to the audience, but not for them. You're responsible to your, for your, to your audience, but not for them. Just do the best that you can. Prepare and make sure everything's amazing to the best of your ability, and then belt it out. And if they sit there doing their emails or whatever at the same time, then that's what it is. Generation Z, which are the guys who are now coming into the workplace, are used to working on five screens at once. Five screens at once. I mean, think about it, we're all the same. Do you, how, many, how many of you watch TV with your phone in your hand while you're doing social media or on, on, the, on the BBC website? Yeah, we all do, right? So if we do it, and I'm an old foge, think about those kids who are even more hardwired to this. What are they going to be doing, right? So the fact is, that's where you've got to be more engaging. You've got to keep it energized. You've got to keep it fast moving. The stuff I, the stuff you teach as a presentation skills coach anyway, which is 90% of my work, is you've got to keep it moving. You're better off speaking too quickly than too slowly. Trust me. Really, you are. And especially with this, because there's just too much going on. Right? So keep it on trucking. And I've heard many say the opposite. It looks professional to have a company logo and not a messy house. Yeah, true. Why do you have to have a messy house? Why do you have to have a messy house? You, you're presenting that as the only two options. Why not just get yourself set up where there's a blank wall behind you? Nobody, everybody can do that. Grab their attention early. When people come into this, the challenge that we have a lot of the time is um, that we, the, the problem is, is that it's it, we're kind of, you know, doing that thing about, well, you know, what do you think? Uh, it's, sorry, you know, are we online? You know, can you all hear me? Just put something in the chat. So the thing is that it, the problem with Zoom presentations or online presentations is, it's not like standing up and doing it face to face. You walk on, you stand there in front of an audience, they just stop, right? They sit there, they know it's about to start, and off you go. Different when you're doing this. So you're gonna drift into it a bit. And so therefore, when you start your presentation, make sure you grab people's attention early. When I started my presentation, I didn't go, thanks very much, really great to be here. Thanks very much to Colin for organizing this. Amanda's been great, we've been working together. Oh yeah, I mean, I really like these guys. We did a session earlier this year and it's just absolutely brilliant. And you know, lockdown's not great. And what about the weather? Yeah, and you know, well, you know what? I mean, Halifax, it always rain. You know, I don't do any of that. What did I do? I said, what do you think of the shirt? Come on, come on, it's a beauty, isn't it? Right, and you're sat there going, why is he talking about his shirt? What I'm doing is I'm putting a pattern interrupt early doors in, getting your attention thinking, and you're going, hang on, what's this all about? You've got to be different. This is standard practice for presentation skills, not just online. It's best to slow down talking when dealing globally, but in English is not a first language. So it's not always best to talk fast. True, true, yes. Mark, love this less is more. Simplify, reduce, shorten, golden rule all these years. <clears throat> Some people disagree, and I, and I had a very strong conversation with the, the chief exec last week in the group when we, we talked about the fact that when you're, your job as a presenter is to get the information you want to get across in the shortest possible time, in the least number of words. And the biggest reason The, re the big <laughs> it's going, traffic's terrible. You're a troublemaker, Chester. Just don't remember what it is that you're saying in the shortest possible time. You're just giving people a great chance to remember. Let me just test this for you now. What I want you to do in the chat box, please, if you were memory championships. What year did I first enter my World Memory Championships? I told you earlier. <laughs> 1863. Somebody's going to get a blooming knuckle rub. 
Eighty Philly. No, don't, don't don't care. Maliki doesn't care. I like that. Fair enough. You don't care. At least you're honest. I like honesty. Small detail. Ah. No, oh, okay, fair enough. Always interesting. <clears throat> Put up the monkey ones. Coach Collins, not important. So the, the interesting thing here is Coach Collins says it's not important. Not important to who? Because it's important to me. So if I'm sharing something with you, you go, it's not important. Fair enough. But you never quite know when you're going to need that information. If we had a meeting, say, you know, we had a, a, a private one to one meeting, and you came back and you go, you know what? When you went to those first world memory championships back in 96, wasn't it? And I'd go, wow, you remembered it was 96 and go, well, you told us at the session, didn't you? He said it was 1996 when you went to your first world memory championships. And I go, Do, have you any idea how many people remember that? And, I, and it, you would go, yeah, not many. So the thing is, that, yeah, it's all well and good, so it's not important, but you never quite know what's going to be important. So it isn't. The point I'm making, it might not be important, it really cares. The point is this, and this is, this is an important point. When you're talking to people and you're giving them information, you would be genuinely shocked about how little they remember. You could be giving out winning lottery numbers and people will still not remember what they are. Just, they just won't. I'm afraid this is, as a memory guy, I'm just telling you this from my personal experience, but you know this as well. How often do you read a book in, that was amazing and life-changing? How much of it do you remember? You, re, you read something like Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, a brilliant book. How many, of just seven basic things in a book that, has been, that then has been covered many, many times and that you took weeks or a couple of months to read. And yet a year later, how many of you could remember? Just seven, not many. And so the point is, is that when, you get, when you're presenting, you want to be as impactful as you can and use as little information as you possibly can. Less is definitely more. <laughs> cool. So it's interesting, isn't it, now? I talked about my background earlier. The, the questions were a bit softer. I throw in a couple of challenges. All of a sudden, the conversation gets a little bit more, a little bit more testy, which is kind of how I like it, right? Because the fact is we all should feel a bit uncomfortable. It's only when we really feel uncomfortable. It's easy when somebody's just kind of stroking our hair. And, you know, it's always good to have an opinion. So, but less is more. And that, again, that's another theme. When you're presenting less is more, really, really it is. And I'll give you a, a quick, nice, quick example. A lovely little anecdote. We all remember Steve Jobs, founder of Apple, one of the co-founders of Apple, and unfortunately passed away now. But many years ago, when he was getting into advertising on TV back in the 80s, he went to see a guy called Lee Klaus, and Lee Klaus ran a marketing agency. And Steve Jobs went to see Lee Klaus and he said to Steve Jobs, I want this 30 second advert or a 30 second advert with these five things in it. And Lee Klaus said, you can't have five things in an advert for 30 seconds. And Steve Jobs was not a guy to take no for an answer, was it? As we kind of remember. And so I'm sure they had a bit of a discussion, shall we say, to say the least. And then Lee Klaus says, let me prove the point. So what he did was, this is a true story because I've checked it out. He got a piece of paper, screwed it up into a ball, and then he threw it to Steve Jobs and Steve Jobs caught it. He then took five pieces of paper or four more, created, you know, five balls, threw them all at Steve Jobs and Steve Jobs didn't catch any. And he got the point. The point is you can have too much information in a presentation. You'll overload the brain and people just can't remember. There's something called the serial position curve. And the serial position curve is how much you remember in a presentation. And we remember the most from the beginning, significantly more. That's called primacy. And we remember things from the end, recency, which is the last thing. So if you've got a very, very important point to make, then you make sure you make it right at the beginning, really emphasize it. And then you make sure you repeat it right at the end, usually in a different format. Okay. So it's all about impact. 
One of the things I've seen work well where possible is having two presenters, alternate delivery, while the other monitors catch us chat questions. As you know, people feel more comfortable to speak in this environment. Plan to break up the session at convenient intervals to respond and allow more personal engagement with the audience. This also allows time for viewers to reflect on what you have delivered so far before you move on to the next part. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with most of that. The one thing I've not seen done well, I've only seen it done about three or four times, but I've not seen it done very well is when, when we've had, when I've seen present, present, people presenting pairs in a face-to-face -face conference, because it just becomes, you don't know which one to look at, and then, and, and then when they pass it over to the other person, it's really hard not to do it artificially. And you go, right, so now John's going to talk about this. And then John starts talking. They go, well, David, and oh, back over to you. And it ends up becoming a bit disjointed. It, I've, not, I've not seen it done very, very well. And then, of course, when people ask questions, they don't know who to ask. But I think in this case, if you had, you know, potentially if you had somebody who was monitoring the chat and then giving you questions, possibly, I mean... I think it's different. I think it, and now with another moment. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what that is. But Ant and Deck, they do it, they do it very well on TV, don't they? I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit on the fence with that, which is not really me, as you probably imagine. I don't really, I always have an opinion. I've just not seen it done well at a conference. I think those two guys, I tell you what, you never watch it and not and 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 not think they've not prepared to the eyeballs, have they? They just prepare and prepare and prepare. You can see they pre prepared every single section. And these things like Bake Off, isn't there? You know, we we watch a lot of Bake Off in this house, right? So um yes, I'm not entirely sure about tw twin presenters. But, but on, in, this, in this environment, if you're doing it this way, you probably flick over anyway, you give it up to somebody else. So Amanda introduced you, Spire, and then she passed it up to Colin, Colin introduced me, and then Colin passed it up to me. So, you know, yeah, I don't know. But online, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Signaling is a vital online skill, broadcasting clear constraint instructions so your audience know what's coming. Well, you know, Chester, it, it's in, it depends. Signaling may be, may, be, may be true. And instruction, I think instructions are important. When people, as, as we've gone through the last seven months, what I've seen is that not, people have not always known what to do. For example, when you go into groups, I was in a session the other week, somebody put into groups, and then there were four of us, and it's like, who speaks first? And people over, 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 spoke over each other. So when we went back to the facilitator, uh, privately, I just said, absolutely one thing, if you do break people out into groups, is to put one person down as kind of the moderator so that they bring people in and they make sure people get a fair shake when it comes to time. So instructions are good. What you don't want to do too much is, is you don't want to tell people too much information. It's a bit like, it's a, bit like a film. You, unless you're watching Columbo, which is designed exactly around that, you don't want to see who did the murder right at the beginning. You know, what you do is you kind of get the trailer break comes and then you come up at the end and you find out who, who did what. And so it's a bit like that with, with speaking. If you tell people exactly what you're going to tell them, they, will, they may go, oh, this is going to be amazing. But they also might use it to disqualify what it is that you're going to say. So they go, oh, wait, it's about negotiation. Don't need to learn about that. Whereas actually there might be some really cool stuff in negotiation. That's when they might log off and just disappear and watch CSI or go shopping, right? So always be careful about flagging up too much. I think speakers do it because they're a bit nervous. So they go, right, well, I'm going to tell you today these five things. And you just hope that the audience got, this is going to be amazing. Oh, oh, look at those. But people will use it to disqualify as well as qualify you. Are you looking forward to getting back to speaking in physical conferences? I'm, I'm, I'm very, very excited about doing both moving forward because I have... The last week I did before lockdown, I had four gigs. I had a keynote on the Monday in London. I had a full day on Thursday in London. Our Tuesday I was in West Midlands. Tuesday night we had somebody here, a client. All day Wednesday presentation skills. Back on a coach, uh, on a train to London. I was absolutely knackered. 
come 10 o'clock on Thursday night. And I was like, if this lockdown comes, it'll be a boon for me because I'm just tired of travel, travel, travel. But I'm missing people. You know, because the thing is, I say something to you and then somebody says in here, well, that's your, just your opinion. You know, sometimes things get lost in translation. I can come across a bit harsh. And, you know, some people might take it the wrong way. I get away with a lot more when it's face to face. That's the thing I've learned in the last seven months. I get away with a lot more face to face because people understand that I am challenging, but I care very, very deeply about what I talk about. And I care very deeply about my audiences and that they improve. So yeah, I'm, I'm a bit challenging, but at the same time, they understand basically I'm a cheeky chappy who just kind of says what I want. And if people tell me, you go, you're talking crap, mate. I go, brilliant. I'll take it every day of the week because I'm unoffendable. And so, but something gets lost in translation. So I am looking forward to getting back there. But at the same time, I don't want the travel I had before. So I will offer my clients two options moving forward. It'll be online, and that, but if you want face-to-face, -face, if you want me to get in the car, pack all my stuff up, have to find a hotel, find a gym, take some food with me, because I eat egg whites, which is basically what I eat all day, every day, and all the rest of it, then if you want me to do all that and go and stand around in, in a conference room or whatever, it's going to be more money. So I'm going to work it out. Work, yeah, I'm going to work out how it's going to go. What do you think of solo interactive elements of a presentation? Or in like a, an in-presentation blackboard? I think they seem pretty good. I've not really, I've, I've seen them done a couple of times. I thought one thing that I, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I don't, I don't see many people using many much stuff, really. I think most people are just studying and belting it out. I think the, the best development has been what Amanda's already said, which is using a flip chart. So when I first started doing this, it was all slides, and I just put myself in a box, and I just went through a series of slides. And then I realized, you know, is that the best way to do it? I'll just share the information, and then I'll send the slides on afterwards, which I've got. So I've got slides on remote speaking for this. I'll send it through to Amanda. You get a copy of the slides. It'll all make sense because I want to build a, the relationship with you. I want you to get an, an insight into what it is I'm trying to say. I want you to interact more with me. You'd interact less if it was if it was slides, I think. But I've not seen people use the tech uh, to any kind of deeper level so much, but yeah. It's too young to remember Columbo. <laughs> and Colin, that's not true. Love face-to-face, -face, can't wait. Although do I, I do accept virtually is good enough. Yeah, I think it is Lynn. Lynn, uh, Lynn. Apologies. I think it is, Lynn. It, it is good enough. I think it's about 80%, actually. I mean, I could get the point across. If I've been doing a lot of work with groups and where I used to get, where I've had scores in the past, and I look at scores moving forward, some sessions have been worse. Some sessions have actually just been as good. And it's always never quite what you think it's going to be. So the brain training I do with the memory training and mind mapping speed reading, generally speaking, the scores for that have been lower. The presentation skills, which I thought would really require face-to-face -face interaction, has worked very well online. And you know, I've got a, I've got a Monaco chief exec at the moment who's booked me for six months. I've just done three. We're doing three next year for his monthly meeting. His 300 members of staff never met him. Complete got in touch off LinkedIn. Read, listened to my podcast. Got in touch and he said, "I want to book you for six months." He's in Monaco. I'm here. And everybody goes, "But when you want to go to Monaco once, yeah, six times in a row, no." happy doing it this way and he's paying me the fee that I normally would because the value I can give. So I think that when it comes to presentation skills, uh, when it comes to maybe training, then, then or keynote speaking, big conference stuff, I think it's much better when it's face to face, you've got the environment, you've got that beautiful thing going on, thousand people in a room and it's an air of expectation and you walk on the stage, it's great, right? But when I'm coaching one-to-one, -one, like I do a lot of at the moment, actually it's pretty successful online. So yeah, I prefer to do it face-to-face. -face. People in online training have the screen off doing something else, can impact, there seems to be a lack of desire to call this out. Do you think this is just a feature digital training or something that should be addressed? You know, there's other issues, something I never thought of, somebody said the other day, and that is kind of personal protection, I'm trying to think of the correct terminology, but it is that thing about, you know, some, sometimes people don't want to be seen online. And I was doing it with kids, and of course they don't. So nobody came, everybody's, everybody's camera was completely off. I did a school, 
I, I had 50 kids who were applying to Oxford and Cambridge, and I've shown them how to do the, they have to do the interviews remotely. So I've shown them how to present and be able to talk remotely. Ed White's all day, if we ever get a chance. <laughs> Cheers, Steve. What have been your top three challenges while transitioning to online delivery? And how have you addressed this? The number one was, I didn't know how to present to camera. And what I did was I, was, I would look at the screen to get people's reaction. And, it, and I panicked, I did. I didn't panic, panic, because I'm not that kind of guy. But I, I kind of got a bit, what's going on here? So the response just wasn't what I was expecting. I, after 24 years, 25, 25 countries in 24 years, I, I, can, I, can, I know within 30 seconds of starting speaking to an audience exactly what I need to do. I could turn it on a pinhead and I can morph and adopt and adapt. Can't really do that online. So what I learned was pick a style, go for it, and just keep on trucking through. And that's not how I do. And that's the disadvantage of, as a presenter, not being able to read an audience because I can't read you guys. If I bring you all up, I can't read you. I just can't. Whereas in an audience, you can see straight away, people go, didn't like that, adopt, pinhead, turn straight away on a pinhead. But, um, so that's that's been, that was my number one challenge. The other one was getting used to talking to camera. So again, it's one of the things I'll mention straight away now, you must learn to speak to camera. Please learn to speak to camera. Most people will sit and look at the screen while they're talking to people and they talk like this. But the thing is, they're not seeing your eyes. So what I've learned to do is speak to camera because you know, you're looking at me, you're looking at my eyes on the screen. So what you wanna do is you wanna see that I'm looking at you. Now, of course, if I'm looking down here, I'm not. And it's a bit like having a conversation with somebody when you're looking at their ears like this, yeah? Straight away, you, you know, how, how long would you want to speak to somebody like that for you? Like, Dave, I'm here. So for me, the one thing I've learned to do, which has been useful, and it's just my personal choice, I don't see many people do it, is I've learned to speak to camera. And even if people are asking me questions, I sit and look at the camera. Because it's a bit like if you're having a face to face and somebody's asking you a question, what do you do? You're still silent. You don't sit there and go, well, they ask you the question and then come back, do you? Or you don't go, look down. You look up, you look them in the eye. So what I do is I do that. Sometimes it's quite nice to see the face and see what they're saying. But most of the time, I've just drilled, hardwired my head to the point where I just look at the camera. Somebody's talking, I listen to it through the camera as much as I can. We, not today, by the way, past training, I've been... What do, you like, what do you like to do to ensure you still have the audience's attention during online sessions? <clears throat> it's, it's the same old, same old. Breaks are important. People get, people get just zombied out with Zoom. So you've got you to have breaks, you know, 45, 50 minutes. I think when I did it with you, Spire, earlier in the year, we did, a, we did a full session and we agreed 60 minutes was a max. So we did 60 minutes, then move on. And then we took a good 15 minutes, let people really completely get away because it does affect your eyes and so on. I think that you just, just try and be a big person. What I see is people reduce themselves because this is reductive. They sit there and reduce themselves and they go, well, this is this and this is it. You've got to be a performer, you know? And again, maintain the attention. Just do some stuff, be polarizing, be challenging. You don't have to be offensive. But just say what you think, get people's attention, bring them back on board, make sure it's you know, reasonably fast moving. But the other thing as well is make sure you keep it short. If people sit there and think you're gonna be there for two hours on a Zoom, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna zone out. So try and keep things in short, punchy as possible. I use audience names often to trigger attention, sometimes to signal that this is great, but, not, but only when you know your audience from before. What do you do when you present in a virtual conference? Don't know any of, anyone from 100 plus people in the audience to trigger their attention. Well, a mate of mine does this the other way around. So instead of it just being a nice thing to do, what it'll do is it'll bring somebody's name up and it'll just go, um, and he says he does this. And I think this is brilliant. He does it with those people who've turned the video off. So, right, so I'm looking at you all now. I'll put you up on the full screen. There's quite a few people who don't have the videos on. So I would just go, right then, John, so what do you think of this? <laughs> John's disappeared, right? Then John, you know, there's that embarrassed silence. And then there's that thing. And actually, I did this with a pharmaceutical company earlier this year. So the pharmaceutical company, I want them on for an hour. It's CPD, 
they're going to turn the videos off. I said, don't worry about it. I'll ask a couple of questions. Just, I'll just say, so, blah, de, blah, de, blah. What do you think of that, John? And, you know, just wait to see if they re reply. And he says, well, if they don't, you tell me who doesn't. And this was serious because he didn't want people just signing on at 11 o'clock, disappearing, doing something else, watching TV for an hour and just having an hour off. So just in that he decided to switch it around and use it as a control measure because if then people think they might be getting us, then they pay more attention. That's a good idea anyway in any audience. I just do that and I just go, brilliant. So, you know, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? I, I tend to pick on, I don't pick on people um, ever because it's just a bad thing. But if I, if I look at somebody who, um, if, if I see people talking and I see them talking for any period of time, because somebody might be going, that's a really good point. Do you think we could use that for work? So there might be a valid reason for them having the conversation. Trust me, over the years, I've embarrassed myself so many times by going, what are you talking about? And they go, we're just having a chat about what you said and how we could use it for work. I look that big, right? So I've learned. But if you get people who just sit there and chat for 10 minutes, I've just got brilliant. So what do you think of that? And they go, oh, okay, what? But, and so like online, there's always little stuff you can do. Thanks for teaching me and technology, telling me people's names. I use names of people as often. I mean, I do it when I'm meeting people. If I've got, you know, if, I mean, I do it as much as I can face to face. When I meet people beforehand, I get there early. I get to chat to people. And, and I like that. I know, I, I, know I, I go on about the weather and traffic, but I really want to know people. And I want people to have a great experience. You know, every single, the one thing, I mean, probably the biggest thing I've learned at 52 is, you know, I'm an atheist. Once the lights go out, it's gone forever. You know, we're gone forever. For me, there's no, there's nothing. It's proper eternal darkness. And so every day counts. And so therefore I have a massive duty and responsibility. I want to take your time right now to tell you what I think and try and get you involved and, and you know, and give you value. And that's why I'm just keep going through stuff all the time. I'll tell you what I think and shake things up a little bit because I want it to be a value, even if it might be a bit destabilizing because it's going against something that you, you think or believe. That's a good thing too. I love it when people turn around and go, Dave, you're wrong. I go, awesome. Tell me why. I love that. I love that. I love it when people just go, no, Dave, I've got, I've got research over here that says you're wrong, mate. And I go, tell me. If you're crying out loud, tell me. Even if it's in the middle of a talk, I've had it before. People go, that's not correct. I go, tell me. Where can I find out? Selfie videos on Facebook annoy me when they aren't looking at the camera whilst talking. How many do? 1%? What they do is they look at themselves on the screen, but it's there. The camera's there. So what they do is they're looking at the screen there, but the camera's there. I've, I never work it out. I've had like top, top business people. I put up a Facebook Live and a private message. I didn't do it in public. Private message. I said, Great video, great content, really engaging. By the way, just to let you know, um, you know, you need to look at the camera. And they always come back and we're like, and, and swear at me. And it's like, no, it, don't, it doesn't matter. It's just, and it's like that, yes, but they didn't turn around and say, thanks very, you know, when, when, when somebody's doing well, they go, yeah, I did well, it's brilliant. When they're not doing well, they go, oh, well, yes, but it doesn't matter, does it? Doesn't matter. I had a speaker mate of mine who's a brilliant speaker, did a video, put it up online, 35 erms in two minutes. Erms should be zero. Anytime, personal or business conversation, you should never use an erm or an hour, ever. If you go back through this recording, and I'll have been on this line for whatever, an hour and a half, you will find zero erms, maybe one. But I, of course, I've drilled them out. There should never be any filler stuff at all. Should never be any erms and hours. You shouldn't have and stuff or and things like that you put on the end. You shouldn't start sentences by going, so. So I've, I've had guys who go, so what we're gonna talk about today is this. So I'd just like to know what you think. And it's a verbal tick, get sure, particularly online. Do you, you always use for chat for questions as opposed to getting people to speak? Not always, but more often than not, simply because you can't have people, you can't be unmuted because the rustling and the little noises just destroy you. If you've only got a smaller group of people, then what I'll do is I'll kind of be sat here, I'll have the, I'll, cause my webcam's up here. I'm not using my computer, but I could use a, my computer, my camera's there, but I choose to use a webcam. Cause the quality, I've got an Apple MacBook Pro, get good tech, Apple MacBook Pro. I don't think the camera's good enough. So I spent 130 quid, got myself a Logitech, a little tripod, and I'm talking straight to camera. Right, we are three minutes away. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go 
Uh, I'm going to go through a couple, couple, any more points that people have. So you've had a ton of tips there about how to try and get as much impact as you can when you're talking virtually. You've said earn five times. <laughs> Cheers, Phil. <laughs> Cameras on iPads are offset to the corner. I've made that mistake, yeah. Is there anyone out there who specializes in virtual negotiation? That would be useful. That person, that, you, that lady or guy should be bloody busy at the moment. Because I tell you, that's a skill, isn't it? Negotiating virtually. Think audience-centric experience during your planning. What will they experience? Yes. Yeah, when, you, when, you're doing your, when you're doing your prep, try and think about what it is they're going to get out of it. I do interactive exercises. You spied, booked me earlier this year. We did a full session on memory, mind mapping, and speed reading. Can't even remember my session. Only been delivering it 24 years. And in the memory section, we do a memory exercise. I give them 20 objects, then I show how much to do it. There's lots of stuff like that. When are we doing presentation? If I'm doing presentation skills, I get people doing it through, through the camera. I say, right, 60 seconds, talk about Donald Trump give them an evaluation and get them doing exercises. I never get people sat there staring at the camera for 60 minutes, always giving people interactive exercises. Scatter, scatter, staggered, how many reporters and leaders use ups and outs? It's a trainable skill. It is, You've got to get shut, all of them. It's one of the things that makes, it's the difference between night and day for me. It's the one thing that absolutely sets you apart. Truly believing in what you are actually saying will carry through to your delivery. People can sense when you don't believe it in yourself online. That's true, Matt, to a certain extent, but it's amazing how many times I see newish speakers who are nervous, and because they're nervous, the delivery is not brilliant, and therefore you don't get a sense always of how much somebody believes in what they're saying. This is a performance. I'm what's known as an ambivert. An ambivert is, and this is where Colin should not invite me to the party because every time I walk into a room full of strangers, I get a drink and sit at the back and just watch it all unfold. And, and I have zero interest in being the center of attention. If somebody asks me something, I'm happy to talk. This is a performance. This is, this is a conditioned performance from 24 years of understanding that I've got to have this funny look on my face and use my hands and got to have an inflection and when to stop and when to pause and when to use my hands and whatever it is, this is a performance because I need to get you engaged. And it's not just get enough given information, but newer speakers, they don't have that. And so sometimes it can be a mismatch between what they're saying and whether they believe it. No ums and ours, but always a few profanities. Yeah. Can't, can always few, drop a few bollocks in. Really curious about the first memory book you read. Would you recommend to improve your memory now? No, I'd recommend mine. And now, now that you've mentioned it, what I will do is I'll put it in the Dropbox folder with the remote video, remote, remote speaking video. I'll put that in there. In fact, I'll tell you what, I'll put in a load of stuff. I'll give you a load of stuff and give it to Amanda and she can send it out. So I'll give you a 10 part video program for memory. I've got six hour audio program. I've got some PDFs. I've got a PDF of my book. I've got a 40 minute video on how to do remote speaking. I'll give it to Amanda and Colin. Give it all to you, because it's all about sharing. Share the love, right? Right, that's it, I'm done. 26, I wanna value your time and particularly Amanda and Colin who brought me on because I can't do my job without with my, my fans, if that's, if that's not too strong a word, but people who want to work with me, which I understand because see, I'm still at that stage where people phone me and go, we wanna work with you and I go, me? because I know there's thousands of speakers out there. So when people like Amanda and Colin and the great guys down at Uspire, when they when they book step forward, it means a huge amount. But, but thank you. Look at, the, look at the, the way that you've interacted. I can't believe it. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Find me on LinkedIn. Come and say hi. Anything you need, I'm here. You want to give a call or a Zoom and you have a chat. I mean, it's all for free. And... I'm happy to help, really delighted to help. And I really wish you all the best. You know, next year may not be any better than this year. So we're gonna to have to learn, just gonna to have to learn and manage ourselves through it. If we wait for external factors for our happiness and success, we are gonna be disappointed, is my opinion. I manage myself, manage what I can manage, maximize what I can manage, put the negative stuff over there in the box, deal with it when I have to. 
and I, I'm we're gonna be I'm gonna I know I'm gonna be fine and that and I hope you are too genuinely really because it's just it is I don't think it's anything less than a terrible time and that's it Amanda back to you thank you thank Amanda you. Colin and Joe and everybody thank you Dave our job at Uspire is to bring you provocation energy and to challenge you to think deeply and differently every single time i hear dave speak and we use dave a lot is exactly what he does so i'm going to ask you to give us a virtual round of applause for dave because he's done exactly that thank you thank you thank you thank you to you your job guys as leaders in your field and i know you're all leaders in your field i'm going to ask you two things number one continue to allow yourself the time to come onto these things to join new tribes and new communities that are going to allow you to just have the time to debate and think and disagree and agree and think differently because that's that is our that's our mission we are looking to create the finest commercial leaders in the world and you know the i've it's been a joy to see and hear the chat it's probably one of our best chats we've ever had so thank you thank you so much for your um your your interaction and your contribution the only job that you've got now is to maybe go away and try some of the things that dave suggests and see whether you have a better impact than you had before and get some feedback our offer of coaching is absolutely serious. Please do. If you would like to grab a coaching call with any one of our board members, just let Jo know. She'll follow up with all the information that Dave talked about, but just let Jo know because we'd absolutely love to uh, carry on this journey with you. So I am going to say thank you very much for coming. Thanks to everybody for turning out and have an amazing weekend. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. It's been a, been a great session. Really appreciated your engagement. And David, you've been brilliant as always. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Cheers, guys. <laughs>